My name is Lars Ribbel. I'm uh, from one of these network partners that were mentioned in the inauguration. We are from the CNRD, Centers for Natural Resources and Development. I'm personally from the Technical University in Cologne. And one of the achievements of this, uh, let's say, network, and uh, this is a network of networks, is this conference. I think it's one of the most precious achievements because we have it every year and every year it's, again, fascinating and I think uh, contributing very much to, to solving the problems that we were confronted with this, this morning and we are confronted with all the time again. On the other hand, we also had another achievement that is, for example, establishing a network of master courses on integrated water resource management. Uh, and some of the colleagues are here from around the world, so we have a network teaching the same topic, IWRM. And I always say, okay, for the students, it's very simple. We just have one goal, and that is water security. IWRM is the way towards it, but the goal is water security. But of course, it's not perhaps that simple and uh, we are uh, b before i introduce the 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 high level panel perhaps just to start with a discussion here on a topic of water security to to bring us back to the uh, to the main theme of the conference let us just revisit what we understand under water security and how it relates to the topic we are discussing here if you can sh show it, if not, it's also not a problem. Um, there's one slide that is maybe also cut for the uh, because the the bottom of the slide is not visible for all of you. I think. Okay, it's not a problem if it's not. Uh, but the slide is basically a, a graphic I personally like a lot because it's a it's an infographic from UN Water on water security and it shows the different elements of water security and we see here that it is of course the security of water for people and for human well-being as one very important key element we see the importance of water security for all economic activities and here we see also the nexus of course very clearly because it's economic activities like agriculture economic activities like hydropower basically all the production uh, and consumption is related to water uh, in, in one way or another. But it also shows the ecosystems. The ecosystems on one hand being water dependent, but also being the systems that provide us with water, bringing the service to us of clean and uh, enough water that we need to make water security possible. And then the fourth key element that is shown in this infographic is, is the relation to water uh, and disasters. You know? And here we are talking about climate change in particular and how disasters and climate extremes are changing and of course impacting the water security in all other dimensions. So the high level panel today is about this aspect and of course it's the theme of this uh, conference on the new normal that we are witnessing, and I think it is confirmed over and over again uh, re regarding the climate system that, that we are observing on one hand, and water security on the other hand, and how these two are influencing each other. Okay, now there, if you go one slide further, you can see the graphic, but uh, of course also we have to be reminded of the time, and, and I cannot go through it again, I think. Instead, uh, after confirming that the, the topic we are discussing here, and uh, that is uh, how we are addressing this new normal, the, the new normal of extremes that we can witness, and, and uh, Rolando Celery has given examples right here from Ecuador, but also referring to other places where at this very moment we are facing with climate extremes, either floods, storms, or droughts, even heat islands are there, and of course uh, they, may be, they may impact uh, the way we are using water or the way we should use water. So how do we deal with these uh, situations? And for that I'm very happy to be able to moderate this high-level panel with a highly esteemed group of experts from different sectors, and this is also what uh, in, in the inauguration was mentioned, it is of course a 
conference that is coming from the scientific community uh, developed by these university networks, but with a purpose to build the bridges to other sectors, in particular, of course, to practice, to society, to policy. And for that, we need to be in a dialogue and we need to uh, step out of our bubbles. No, we are always in these bubbles of uh, experts of the same kind, of certain uh, sectors uh, of certain regions, perhaps, and we need to step out of these and understand each other, uh, learning to speak the same language, uh, but also understand each other towards finding solutions. And this is the purpose to have here uh, people from different backgrounds uh, representing their perspective, their knowledge, their solutions, but then also uh, opening up the dialogue after that, inviting you for questions and, and having a, a second round of dialogues. I'm introducing you in the, in the order where I would like to ask you some uh, guiding questions um, and uh, there's no other order possible. Uh, so the first uh, one I would like to uh, introduce is Bolivar, Bolivar Erasso to the very right. Uh, so Bolivar Erasso is the executive director of the National Institute of Metrology and Hydrology. I think if you have this thematic uh, conference and you are in Ecuador, to invite you is a must, no? because you are bridging these two topics, uh, let's say water and climate. And you're also the representative of Ecuador to the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. You are an engineer by profession from the Polytechnic School, the National Polytechnic School, I guess it's in Quito, and you did your PhD in France. And you are an expert from your academic background, uh, also on, uh, on cl analyzing climate data, also interpolation of data, etc. But at the moment, of course, you are much more related to preparing data in a form that it can support decision making. So a very key person on this panel. And before I ask the first question to you, let me introduce the other members of this panel first. And that is then in the second, uh, in the second question and then some elaborations, Anna Ochoa Sanchez. She's professor from the University of Asuai. Asuai, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, for those who are not familiar, we are in Cuenca, of course, everyone knows that, but that is the capital of the province of Asuay. So the University of Asuay is also located here in Cuenca. And you're a professor there, and you have a background uh, on water resources engineering from the KU Leuven, and a PhD from Cuenca. Uh, and uh, I remember, Rolando, when we were here, you inaugurated, or you initiated the PhD program here, that, that was 2016, if that is correct. And you are the first graduates uh, ever from this program. So yeah, you can be very proud and the University of Cuenca can be very proud. And you are an expert for hydrology and climate change interactions. So also, of course, predestined to be here on this panel. And if I'm correct, you also do a lot of research recently in the Pramo or the role of, of the high mountain ecosystems in, uh, in, in managing water and also, in, of course, preserving these precious ecosystems. Then, and that is not the, or the seating order, but uh, in the middle, uh, we have here uh, Jens Hönerhoff, our honored guest, uh, coming theoretically from Germany, from Cologne, from the DEG, but uh, at, at the moment living in, in Ecuador. He is, um, if that is correct, a vice president for sustainability in, in the DEG, which is the the private sector development finance arm of the KFW, the German Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So uh, dealing with issues of uh, investment in, uh, in, uh, in activities of the private sector. And he has initiated many interesting um, activities that are related to water and climate change, like the Alliance for Water Stewardship, uh, but also the Water Risk Filter, which is a global tool to, to understand uh, water-related risk. And he has been in countries where we are also very active, but at different times, unfortunately, uh, like for the uh, GIZ in Costa Rica, uh, but also for the DED in Chile, um, we have 
members in these countries, and but we have been there at different times. But of course, you have a vast experience uh, worldwide, but in particular for Latin America. So we're happy to have you here. Um, I also welcome Viviana Morales. Um, she's the president, but also working as an hydraulic engineer at AXAM, where that is a construction engineering uh, and consultancy um, company uh, for uh, he located also here in Cuenca, but being renowned in the whole country and uh, even region. She has an engineering degree from the University of Cuenca and also a PhD uh, from the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign. Mm. Has nothing to do with the sparkling uh, wine. No, it's uh, it's the name of the university, Urbana-Champaign, um, a well-known university in the US, of course. And last but not least, we have here Wouter Buttard. Um, if I pronounce your name correct, sorry for that. I <laughs> Flemish. Um, is not my mother tongue, but uh, Wout, Wouter is a professor in hydrology and water resources um, at the Department of Civil and, and, and uh, Environmental Engineering at the Imperial College, very well known uh, university um, and also a, a renowned expert uh, in areas like hydrological processes, river basin management and sustainable development. And his research is as far as I, 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 I look at it, always trying to provide knowledge with a relevance for decision making. No, it's um, it, it's uh, some fantastic examples I think you will share with us. And uh, I think something special to mention is also that you won the Darcy Medal of the EGU, which is a highly esteemed uh, recognition in 2022. 20, so that is that was for his achievements in water resources research and engineering. So. Very happy to have you here, and very happy to have you all here on this panel. And uh, without any further ado, let us enter into first a set of questions. And here also, uh, please answer in five minutes so that we still have a chance to open the floor. So while listening to the panelists, um, please prepare some questions, which I will collect. And then we have a last round where you can answer the questions and give perhaps also some reflections after listening to the other panelists. After five minutes, I will become a little bit more nervous, perhaps, so you can see my my gestures, or uh, I will make uh, some signs that you will note that we should come uh, to the next question. In the same order, then, uh, Bolivar Eraso, um, as the expert, the expert here in, in this precious country uh, on uh, climate, of course, also on meteorology. What can you tell us about the observed changes in the in the past? No, uh, if we are claiming there is a new normal, of course, we need evidence. No, so is there evidence uh, on, uh, let's say, observed changes? And w what do you see as the right strategy to cope with these, these uh, challenges that emerge from these um, climate extreme related impacts? You can also Hello. come, yeah. if you like, Good morning. you can come yeah. here. That works. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will try to speak completely in English because actually my French is more fluent, but uh, <laughs> there are no problems. <laughs> so uh, it's a really interesting uh, question at INAMI, the National Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, we are in charge to uh, measure the basic variables like uh, temperature, rainfall, uh, radiation, humidity. So that are the base, basic information to understand how, uh, how that works, how the, uh, how the country works, uh, how was the conditions, how was the weather conditions in, country, in the country. Uh, about the extreme, uh, extreme events in Ecuador, it's a research, it's, it's a research uh, task for us we already start to study that, but we have the information that in the last five years, we already have more frequent extreme events in the last five years. For example, we have data that in one or three days happens the rainfall of all the month. So that already 
happens, and we have the data to show that. But it's a research task to uh, use uh, more data of every uh, of all the all the uh, meteorological network to do a complete research about that. Uh, and uh, I think that is really, really important uh, because I know the work of the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. Um, it's a global project like Early Warnings for All. It's a really, really interesting project already financed by w, WMO, development banks, developed countries. Uh, that uh, and the objective is is to 2027 uh, protect all countries uh, with early warning systems. Uh, that means that uh, we need around uh, 800 million of dollars to invest everywhere. But with this invest, we will economize or will uh, or will will avoid. Uh, expenses in around uh, three to 16 billions. So uh, invest in early warnings, it's an investment, uh, a key investment. Uh, in Ecuador, we already, we already developed with uh, international cooperation, uh, also some interesting hydrological, uh, hydroinformatics uh, applications. Uh, for example, one of us is uh, Inami GeoGlose. Uh, Inami GeoGlose is a platform that works with the uh, with uh, with GeoGlose uh, hydrological model, global hydrological model, and it's already implement is already implemented for the country, and we can uh, measure, we can simulate uh, um, streamfalls, is historical streamfalls in more than 2,000 rivers in Ecuador. And we can simulate the past, uh, the past streamflows, uh, stream but also the future. Uh, we can um, we can project the uh, the future uh, the future 15 days. So it's is is a really nice uh, a platform that already works. is online. is open source. It's open for uh, for everyone, and it's also a tool in preparedness for the El Niño. Uh, El Niño event, uh, 23, 24, uh, 2023, 2024. And the final informatic platform is a regional platform that calls, uh, um, uh, it's, um, it's a platform that calls, I, I forget the name, um, but it's a regional uh, platform that uh, works for Colombia, Ecuador, and, and Peru. And is specifically signed for um, for flash flood for flash flood uh, uh, streams. So uh, these tools will help us to uh, project how will happens in the in the in in the future four or five hours. So it's another tool, but uh, for another for another uh, uh, time project time projection. So. The final message that is like uh, as Inami, we already we already uh, we already installed installed in the in, in the country. We already uh, invest. We already uh, uh, create and implement some hydroinformatic platforms to be prepared uh, for uh, for simulate the past and uh, and uh, and project the future. Of course, in parallel is the reactivation of all the meteorological and hydrological stations that fits these platforms. Uh, so the final message us is that the last two years we already work in reactivate uh, the, the the meteorological and hydrological stations. We already activate some hydroinformatic platforms uh, to be prepared to uh, measure all the countries and of course in these in these years to be prepared for El Niño 2023-2024. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for these insights uh, on the on the current status here in Ecuador. Thank you for keeping the time exactly. Perfect. <laughs> and yeah, without any further ado, let's uh, let's let's continue. And uh, I think uh, Ana Ochoa Sanchez. Uh, 
we stay in Ecuador, perhaps for the consideration of a very important ecosystem. Oh, by now also the figure is there. So ecosystems, of course, play an important role. They, as I said, they depend on water. We need to preserve them. On the other hand, they provide us with water. And that is just to mention a few of the services. So could you perhaps uh, enlighten us a little bit on your research, um, especially regarding the paramos and the, the relevance of, of other uh, important ecosystems? Uh, how are they impacted by climate extremes, but how could they also be used as a solution uh, to, to cope with a new normal of more extremes? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. And I want to welcome all of you to our beautiful city. I hope you have the chance to visit it. Okay, so related to the hydrological changes, for example, that we have seen in the Paramo, uh, well, the Paramo depends on precipitation, depends on on surface water. And as it was saying, there are some uh, data that we have, but we still have that scarcity. We have still uh, mixed trends on how precipitation has been uh, has been uh, working. So uh, what we do know is that we will have extreme precipitation events during wet seasons. We know that we will have less rain during dry seasons, longer droughts, and uh, that will affect, of course, uh, the hydrological uh, processes in the Paramo. But also the, the warming will affect transpiration, it will affect evaporation, and uh, therefore water availability. One thing that is also important is that warming can affect soils. And soils in the Paramo have high organic matter content and a high water retention capacity. And if that is affected, then we will lose for sure hydrological services uh, and hydrological regulation of our catchments. So uh, we have that climate change issues, but these are mixed with land, land use changes. And uh, we have already seen 40% uh, of our original paramos changed to uh, agricultural field. And... Uh, Okay, so uh, this mix between uh, climate change impacts and land use change impacts is that what I think that will seriously affect the hydrological regulation of our catchments. And we have to know that we rely on the Paramo because as uh, the water resources in our country relies on the Paramo because we have lost a lot of Andean forests, so we rely on this ecosystem. So regarding regarding the other question about the role that the mountain ecosystems can have on these maybe adaptation strategies. I have two thoughts about that. One is that we have physical capacities through nature because we have these different altitude ranges and we have agricultural land mixed uh, diversity crops in these different altitudes in the in our mountain ecosystems and we can rely on that for some adaptation strategies based on ecosystems like for example in the northern part of our country we have a, a conservation site in the upper part of the mountain and the former owners of the this land were given a place in the lower part of the ecosystem in the lower part of the Paramo. So we can use these kind of adaptation strategies based on ecosystems to cope with the problem. Uh, another uh, capacity that we have in our mountains is <coughs> organizational capacity. So Andean communities have representatives, usually they have that, and this enables discussion, this enables uh, decision making, like for example, the water funds that we have here uh, the water funds have resources to conserve, to restore the Paramo, the higher parts of the Paramo, and to uh, maintain these hydrological regulation services of the Paramo. So this, uh, uh, this is like adaptation based on communities on the other hand. So I think we have this couple of strengths that we can um, use. But the thing that is lacking, and I think that we can see here, and that we will be able to look at some of the sessions here and discussions here is that we need these interactions among science, among academia, decision makers, uh, society in general, 
to really construct some adaptation strategies that can lead to these climate resilient development pathways that not only take into account uh, development, um, sustainable development, but also take into account social justice and these equity issues. So we have very inequalities, a lot of inequalities in our countries, in mountain systems as well, and that we need to also take a look into that. So I think these synergies among academia, policymakers, decision makers are uh, key and important and um, yeah, we will be seeing a lot of that discussions, I hope, in this, in this conference. Thank you so much for these excellent uh, explanations on the current status and the role of, of Pramos as one example of important ecosystems and how we could maintain them in order to also protect water resources. For anything we do, we of course need the right financial resources and with that we are looking of course at banks, no? uh, banks that are especially interested in supporting development uh, like uh, the, the bank Jens Hönhoff is representing here and uh, could you share a little bit what your strategies are to, to contribute to coping with uh, these climate extremes, how to increase water security and I think in particular these aspects where everyone basically refers to almost as a panacea, the nature-based solutions is of course something that in particular the private sector that, that you want to fund is not directly buying in, let's say. No? So uh, how do you uh, reach that? What are your strategies to support these kind of activities with a view on the support of the private sector? Thank you, Lars, for the question and also for the opportunity to, to make this kind of link to the private sector. Um, I myself feel like, like a link between my colleagues, which coming from the financial sector, and me as an engineer, have been having working in the water sector and industrial sector for, for many years, for the last 30 years. Um, j just to start with a typical thing from, from a development finance institution saying, hey, we're investing 9 billion uh, US dollars around the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and of course, this asset has to be secured. Hey, I say, where's the translation to what we were defining as a development finance institution in our climate and impact strategy, which luckily, like two years ago, uh, we could define in, at our development finance institutions. And what is about the nine billion? Is that not only a drop in the ocean? Now we're not talking about like not even 1% of, of all investments in this world. And can you really influence this kind of big topics? We are talking about so water security, climate change. And I'm very happy to be here together with uh, a lot of representatives of the academic sector because the link between science, investigation, and application to this knowledge to the uh, public sector and also to the industrial, to the uh, private sector is essential. Otherwise, it cannot be handled, this kind of challenge. And uh, that's why I'm saying I have to do a lot of translation work. And I think your challenge is also to do a lot of translation work of your knowledge. I mean, you've been mentioning all the investigation going on in the meteorological sector, preparing for extreme flood events, uh, which are due to happen because of the climate change events. Uh, how do we get this translation done into public and private sector? How we get prepared? I want to give you some examples. Uh, in our work, for the last 15 years, we've been cooperating with WWF been developing a tool which is called uh, the Water Risk Filter, uh, which is an online platform, trying to make data and knowledge transparent uh, to all sectors, not only private sectors, agricultural sector, which is of course in the focus of water security and nexus to food security, 
but also energy sector for the hydrological importance for the all energy productions. And I'm not talking about only about hydrological uh, hydro plants, power plants, but also all other uh, energy generating plants, but also to the private sector who has needs translation of this knowledge into practice. So first step for us was to develop uh, a tool which helps uh, to make transparent the knowledge generated by all of you, by all of us, and making it transparent with a visualization, with mappings, water scarcity, flooding risks, just to name two of the most important issues, but also go into governance risks of a certain location and also reputational risk. If we talk about uh, private sector, of course, water use is about reputational risk. If you set up an industrial operation, agricultural operation in an area which is already water stressed, of course, the neighbors will ask yourselves, hey, these guys have more money than I, they're taking away my water. How are you going to manage this in a sustainable way? So first of all, making the information in a very, very transparent way. And second, developing measures how to address this kind of uh, water stress, uh, water scarcity, floodings, and all the aspects in it. Mm. We are always talking about internally in our financial institution about uh, that climate is water, water is climate, or probably you've heard that uh, people saying uh, if climate change is a shark, then water is, are the teeth of the shark. Because 80-90% of the issues <laughs> happening in, of climate change are happening in water. There are floodings, there are water scarcity, extreme weather events, and hurricanes, which are becoming more frequent and more extreme. El Nino effect, which uh, in this region is uh, highly discussed because they are all fearing that the next event will be more severe than, than former events. So how to get prepared to be in front of this shark, which we know it's there, and how the teeth are going to bite us, or are we, are we going, going to find ways to avoid this situation and uh, cope with it? So one of the strategies implementing in our companies, first of all in the agricultural companies we invested is, is to make a sustainable management of the water resources, not only of the footprint where they're in, but in the whole basin where they are operating in through implementation of the principles of the Alliance for Water Stewardship, which is a certification scheme uh, set up about four or five years ago, which aims to make water use in a sustainable way. So make common principles how to use this water uh, principles to make it in a sustainable way uh, through this. It's like um, if you've probably heard about FSC certification for sustainable forest management. So in the future, uh, AWS should be the certification for sustainable water management for the private sector. But of, of course, first of all, you have to get this to the clients and we've doing, been doing helping our clients to do analysis. We also invested in the financial sector, which is interesting because they have a very wide footprint. So in two case studies, in Kenya and in Ecuador, we've been analyzing uh, the portfolio of the investment portfolio of those financial institutions have been investigated on their climate risk. On the same topics I've been just talking about how you, your investments are going to be affected by these extreme weather events, basically. How the teeth of the shark is going to in affect your operations. And finally, how the financial institution, the banks, are going to get their money back or not. And doing this in a responsible way, together with the society, I was mentioning the reputational risk. It's not only about reputation, it's about getting to work together in these topics. Because when you don't have the people working on the ground in extreme situations, you can't cope with it, so you have to help each other. 
So this kind of analysis and investigation helps us and helps our clients to be, be, be more prepared uh, for the climate change issues to get more water security. Because they're saying, what is climate? Climate is water for us. So we're trying to get uh, this knowledge out, the knowledge you are generating to the private sector, but also make it accessible to the public sector, enhance cooperation between the public and the private sector to get really a common approach toward these adaptation things. Other colleagues of mine are in working also in the financial institution on the mitigation issue to get emissions down, but I think that is a topic of all different conf conference in this. So, uh, anybody interested of you in to know more about water risk filter and to get this uh, data basically up and running, I'll be participating in one of the sessions at 2 p.m. to 15 p.m. this afternoon, so we can have a more deep dive on, on this kind of issue. But I'll motivate all of you to get more connected or to get your knowledge translated into uh, the practical work and the practical work telling you what do we need in order to get better and to get better prepared for the shark who is already up and there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jens Werner, for, uh, thank you for this nice analogy uh, that we, we are dealing with the teeth of the shark called climate change. So that is nice. I also uh, know that in the water community it's quite widespread to say that what is CO2 for climate mitigation is H2O for climate adaptation. So this is perhaps also emphasizing a little bit the, the role of water. Of course, we always like as the water community to emphasize our importance, no? uh, but I think it is true. And I also thank you for highlighting the need to work together. And I think you personally are an excellent example of connecting with uh, representatives from other sectors. And you mentioned the private sector. Of course, the private sector is involved in so many ways, but if we, at the end, establish solutions, then we are typically looking at consultancy engineering companies or uh, experts who know how to build uh, and how to implement the solutions on the ground. And for that, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that we have here uh, Viviana Morales, um, and I introduced you already, but perhaps you can share a little bit how do you see the the change in recent years? Is there already an, a kind of recognition for the climate change adaptation issues and, and coping with more extremes? Um, and again, perhaps also the question, how can we factor in to these largely gray infrastructure projects, also blue-green infrastructure or nature-based solutions? Do you see that is happening already or what needs to be done so that it can happen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Um, I have had the opportunity to work in, the, in academia and research for seven years during my PhD in the United States. And in the past seven years, I have been working as a hydraulic engineer in a consulting engineering firm. And I have been working mainly on water-related uh, projects throughout Ecuador. And from my perspective, uh, what I can see is that there is a big gap between academia and consulting in terms of uh, water management. Uh, this must be because, um, well, people in the academia and we consultants, we don't talk much, we are not communicated that much. There is also um, lack of public awareness, uh, problems in financing uh, projects. And uh, an example of that is that um, we see that there is a lot of uh, very important research on climate change and extremes, and this is going to shape the future of water uh, management. However, in consulting, uh, is a different word. Um, we don't have uh, much emphasis on climate change in the projects that uh, we do and we design. Um, basically, our clients are the municipal uh, drinking water and sewer companies in Ecuador. And um, in, in, in that sense, it takes a really long time for a, a consulting project uh, to uh, start basically from the idea and the need of a project 
until the project actually starts. It takes a long time, maybe two, three years. And um, once the project starts, we have very limited time and budget to finish the project and meet all the expectations of our clients. And recently, in the past years, uh, we have worked in a couple projects that were financed by mu multilateral agencies like CAF, KFW, and in those projects, we did involve a little bit of climate change. Um, we did something very basically. What we did is that for the design of the future systems and, for example, for sewers and, and potable water systems, we try to see the effect of the increase in precipitation. So we increase the precipitation by a percentage. Um, we took data from the International Panel of Climate Change for that. And based on that, we kind of uh, try to see what is the effect on, on the designs and try to adjust the designs to that. But that is something, as I say, very simple because we were only taking the effect of climate change only in one parameter, for example, rainfall. Uh, in a recent project we did for uh, Guayaquil, um, what we did is that uh, we had um, a neighborhood that has uh, flooding issues and uh, we built a small um, river model and in that model we took the, um, we, we saw the effect on the rises of the ocean levels and also on the precipitation streams. And we try to see how that will affect in the future the river levels and how that will affect the discharges of the sewer into the, into the, into the river. So that is as far as we go in consulting. And that is reason, as I said, um, because of these multilater multilateral projects that we work on. Um, the big problem that I see is that um, basically politicians and uh, also the directors of municipal water companies, they have um, also limited budget and they have to fix day-to-day -day problems with their operation, emergencies that they have. So the planning projects, the big projects, they take really long time to start. And sometimes because we don't have um, standards that involve a chapter on water, on climate change and how that will affect the water management and planning, that is why this is not taken into account in the projects, actually. That's the big thing. Um, what I think is missing is that, that uh, we should have new standards that will include um, some guidelines on climate change. And also, uh, these standards should be developed at Level Congress by a group of people involving politicians, which are the ones who handle all the budget. Also, uh, scientists, consultants and have like a panel of discussion and to build these new standards uh, for the future uh, water management here in, in the country and also in, in South America, basically. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for these insights. And um, yeah, also for this very clear call actually to a group of people that is not at least represented on this panel. And, and it's it's mentioned here also in this nice diagram of UN Water, of course, good governance would in need the direct involvement of politics and, and decision makers in that direction to create something like standards also for, for this new normal. Thank you very much. Before we uh, open up uh, for questions, uh, I would like to invite Walter. Um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I put you at the end because you can, with your vast experience, actually you have also experience in this region uh, and, and for sure you will share that uh, because Walter told me that he did his master thesis studies here and, and did research here for a long time actually. And, and uh, he, he was the founder or co-founder of very beautiful networks that exist until today very efficiently uh, contributing to monitoring and so on. But you also have experience from other parts in the world. You are a very international active scientist. So do you see differences in different parts of the world uh, how climate 
change is impacting water resources and its its sustainability and perhaps also other strategies that uh, are taken in certain regions and last but not least coming back to the role of science do you do you see that the universities do enough or what what could be the potential future role of universities great thank you very much uh, Lars see if I can add anything to what has already been said but yes uh, happy to take a, a broader even global view of the, the problem of climate change and the, the role of, of academia and the scientific community. Let me start with, with the, first, the, the, the former or the first aspect about uh, global patterns of, of, of climate change. And I think it should be important to emphasize from the first or from the beginning that, that a lot of climate change impacts are still very highly uncertain. We know the, the global patterns, if you will, but we know very little about how that translates down into local impacts, how climate change interacts with local processes, with other types of pressures on the environment, on the socio-hydrological system, the way that people use their, their, their resources are exposed to risk. And I think the places, catchments are, are unique, are idiosyncratic, and we still have a lot to learn about how exactly uh, global climate change translates down into the, the local level. Nevertheless, we can, we can clearly identify some patterns. And I think the, the key global pattern is that of an, of an acceleration of the global water cycle, isn't it? In the end, global warming means more energy in the atmosphere, uh, means that warmer air can contain more water. That's a direct result of the clausius clapeyron relation. And that basically means more energy. It's like your car, a bigger engine, give it more fuel. It will start to accelerate, go faster. And that's really what we see happening on a global scale with, with, with the global water cycle. And that really pushes us towards the extremes, more intensive precipitation, uh, higher uh, amounts of precipitation, so bigger floods. But at the same time, also the other end of the spectrum, uh, bigger, stronger, longer droughts. And that's exactly what we don't want to see happening with water. We want to be in the middle, having enough of it as a precious and, and vital resource, but not having to, uh, either too little or too much. And so we really need to start thinking about how we cope with those, ex uh, those increasing extremes. And if you look at that from, from a global level, you see a very worrying pattern that's that the strongest impact happens to be there where people are most, most vulnerable. Think about the tropics. Uh, that's where climate uh, processes are already the strongest. If they ex uh, increase further, then that's the region that really will, will see the, the biggest change. And at the same time, that region, or more generally the global south, is also the region that has um, uh, the, the lowest resources, the highest vulnerability, the lowest adaptive capacity to, um, uh, to, to, to adapt to, to global climate change. And we see that at a global level, we see that also at a local level. Think about flooding, for example. People most exposed to flooding are in many cases informal settlements, people that don't have the, the, the resources to, to, to have a house in a, in a safe place. It's the floodplains that are cheapest, that are easiest to live uh, for people with fewest resources. And, and those are therefore also the people that are most, most exposed. Or even in, in mountain environments, as much as a, as a city like Cuenca is exposed, is the people living on the steep slopes in the rural areas that are most directly exposed to extreme events that might generate landslides, erosion, degradation of the, um, the, the local environment. And so that, that creates really a big problem of equity that those that are most exposed are those that are typically also those with, with fewest resources to adapt. And that brings me to the, the role of, of science and, and academia. Um, obviously, it has a very important role to, first of all, understand and create the, um, the, the knowledge about those processes. And I think the key word here is, is evidence-based decision-making. We'll have as a society to make very important and, and, and profound decisions about how to best adapt to, to climate change, invest in grey infrastructure, invest in green infrastructure, invest in a combination, if so, what combination? And science obviously has an important role to play in generating that, that evidence. The decision-making process is, is very messy, involves political aspects, involves different um, interests, different benefits, uh, different agendas. That's, that's inevitable, but at least as a scientific community, we can try and, and bring to the table the best evidence to make evidence-based uh, based decisions uh, that, that will help us and, and, and give the, 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 the best potential to be sustainable, to be most cost-effective, uh, to be the, the most adaptable uh, to, uh, to future climate change. At the same time, I think we have to be 
to avoid creating this image of science as the, the source of all wisdom, the, 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 what we definitely don't want is scientists sitting in their ivory tower and the rest of society uh, expecting and, then, and hoping that they'll come up with, with the solution. That will not, that will not happen, uh, not just because science is, is limited, but also because there's a lot of other knowledge out there that we should try and adapt into. And I think uh, here the, the key word is that of, of co-production of knowledge, um, uh, realizing and, and, and um, being aware that there's many other types of, of knowledge, especially the, the local knowledge that's so important to deal with, with, with local impacts and local processes, even indigenous knowledge, uh, being aware that that's, um, people all around the world have been living in, in, in very variable uh, and changing environments and often have developed very uh, very ingenious coping strategies to uh, deal with, with those extremes. And they might in themselves not be sufficient uh, to, to cope with future climate change because in the end we will be in a very unprecedented condition. We'll step out, outside that envelope of past observations but we can still try and, and see how to integrate that local knowledge into the scientific body of evidence and sit together to create or to co-design uh, solutions uh, that, that bring us best or that, that allow us to adapt best to, to climate change. And for that inevitably we need to sit together, we need to communicate, we need to make sure that we develop knowledge that is, as they often say, it's useful, usable, and actually used. And that, for all of us, and the scientists in, in particular, brings with it an, um, a responsibility to communicate, to interact, to understand where the, the gaps of knowledge are. But at the same time, I'm, for example, an engineer. I know that, that communication is perhaps not, not the biggest of my skills. So we need to bring in experts that help us with that. Experts in communication, experts in governance, anthropologists that understand how, how local changes might propagate and have an impact on, on local livelihoods, psychologists that help us to understand how people think and how people ingest and, and internalize evidence in their decision making, social scientists that help us understand how people adapt and cope and what impact it has on livelihoods. And so that interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity really is a very important aspect of future research and I think an, an, a really important responsibility for scientists to, to take part in that and, and to develop our research in that direction. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Thanks for your insights into different regions of the world and also to, to remind us that actually we have to contribute to evidence-based decision-making, but also uh, highlighting the, the, the necessity to recognize that universities are not the only institutions that are generating knowledge or keeping knowledge but we need to enter into a co-creation of knowledge uh, and there are other forms of knowledge all around us and we need to connect the dots. And I have to say, uh, it is difficult, is it easy as a professor if we sit with a master student to think about the research design and so on, that's something we learn to do, you know, how to build on the current knowledge of academia and then go a step further. But to really do something that is demand driven would require to step out of the bubble of academia and start a dialogue with people from other sectors. And that's not as easy as it seems. So I think, uh, yeah, all respect for your research, Walter, you have shown uh, good examples for that. Uh, and also, uh, I think this is what we perhaps also step towards, uh, also with a, a small step with this conference to have more of this kind of demand driven research, if we are from research or from other institutions also to reach out and to give a hand to the people from the other uh, sectors. Thank you for these insights and putting some spotlight from your perspective and all together we can perhaps enlighten a bit the complexity of the systems we need to solve. And of course, also developing the solutions together. Um, let me still, let's say I have, uh, we are a bit late but because we started late. So I, I think before I open the round for other comments and questions, I look at the organizers to see how we're doing because officially the time is over, but it's not our fault. Uh, all the panelists were excellent time managers. Uh, I talked a bit too much perhaps, but uh, do we still have 10 minutes? Is, is that, and, and I can, well, I have to ask you because uh, it's not only, it's also coffee security, you know, that we have to think about so that I'm depriving you of that. But perhaps, yeah, I just ask, do you have questions? And perhaps you have some quick ones, uh, not, not whole uh, 
talks, uh, but a quick question to either one of the panelists or some observations from your side that you would like to share. There is one, yeah. Uh, I don't know if we have a, micro a walking microphone. Yes, perfect, perfect. So also um, looking at the time management, perhaps inviting one, two. More, more than a question is some comment. I was uh, writing some notes. I think one of the things that we have to work uh, harder is in terms of the concept. Sometimes we use the same word with different meanings, or it depends uh, uh, of the place. Other thing that also I can see is that there is a lot of gap of knowledge, and sometimes academia move to sexy topics. But the most uh, uh, scary thing for me, especially in developing country, is monitoring. We need better and longer term data. That normally when we go with anybody, it doesn't matter. Normally the answer is monitoring is expensive. And my view is that that is a wrong concept. It's the only way that we, ha we can have good diagnosis to improve our knowledge to correct a decision and to adapt solutions. I think it's, that is one of the methods that I, I suggest between all the group to try to put together in universities, government, companies, that we have to improve in developing countries monitoring. Thank you. Do you have examples? You said we use different words for the same things. Do you have an example? Yes. For example, in environmental areas, the people use, for example, in order to evaluate this relation between drivers, the state of the environment, and the changes impact. For example, in engineering, that is the wrong word. Normally, we use consequence. Ah, OK. OK, that is, for example. And when we put the, the papers on the table, looks like that we are talking about different uh, uh, meanings, but is uh, that is not the, the reality. And also with the, in terms of the response. Thank you very much. Yeah, one there's one hand up. So I will then we have a quick round. You can already think of if if more than one is answering the question is also fine. No? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Lars, and uh, thanks to the panelists uh, for such a, a sharing insightful, uh, you know, experiences. Uh, I'm Nitin Basi. I work with a policy research institution in India. Uh, one thing, when we were talking about water security, and I think uh, a couple of panelists uh, also uh, touched upon those aspects, I think what in a larger domain we are forgetting is to include the community side of it. So a lot of the time uh, when we talk about hydrology, we talk about water resource system uh, resilience and adaptation, I think the focus shifts to the engineering side of it, or let's say the monitoring side of it, without realizing how community can also play an important role, especially when it comes to monitoring and generating data sets at the local level. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's difficult because monitoring systems uh, cannot be placed everywhere and, uh, you know, wherever uh, the stream is flowing or a river is flowing in a basin. But I think a lot of this can be actually enabled if we engage with the community, train them and, uh, you know, make them unable to generate those data sets. We have uh, some examples from India. I mean, uh, there is a big program on participatory groundwater management where uh, the community is engaged to generate data on water levels, uh, water quality, especially in terms of groundwater, and also to come out with the water security plans at the village level or at the local level. So I would also like to know that in your perspective, uh, whether such initiatives have been already uh, undertaken, uh, maybe in the geographies you come from, or what are your opinion uh, on how this uh, community, which is uh, you know kind of a repository of uh, great wealth, how we can utilize it better? Thank you very much. And one more question, a quick one, please. So just really a question. <laughs> Quick one and question. Uh, uh, for Jens, uh, what, what's happening with uh, water footprint compensation? So much stocking has been going on in the, in the last year, but it, it's not really coming true, is it? Uh, what, what are the bottlenecks in the private sector to go into water footprint compensation like we... <coughs> 
we are doing it in carbon, more or less, but water doesn't advance, it seems. Very good and clear question, even uh, now addressed to someone, but let us, uh, let's say, give a collective answer, perhaps, but following the same order uh, as, as before, and uh, try to answer one question, you know, and uh, in respect of the organizers, I think I have to ask you to limit it not as we agreed in two, two minutes, but if possible to one minute each. Uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I may, I may yeah then you start. Yeah, to this. you can start. Um, <clears throat> water is not carbon. Carbon is not water. Carbon goes to all of the atmosphere. You can footprint it. Uh, in our research, we did uh, for the last 15 years, we decided water footprinting is not the solution because the water risk is the topic. And we are talking about the water scarcity, governance. You, all of you know that uh, the water risk and water uh, problem you get is, can be very different. If I produce one ton of soy with 3,000 liters of water, or if I produce it with 5,000 liters of water, it doesn't mean that the soy I produced with 3,000 liters of water is better than the one with 5,000 liters of water. Depends where you are. It depends, and that's why we call it water risk, and that's why we go to, in the when we talk about sustainable water management, we talk about water stewardship, and not water footprinting anymore. And I have to admit, the AWS certification I was mentioning, is a B2B uh, certification, business to business certification. In the long run, it may go onto the product so the consumer knows that this water or the water use is done in a responsible way. But it does not help the consumer to know this has been produced with 3,000 liters of water and not with 5,000 liters of water. That's probably the answer from my side. Mm. Thank you. So yeah, we don't have to follow then any order that uh, let us just continue. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will answer about the, about the question uh, related with monitoring. Um, at INAMI, at the National Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, we are in the work to reactivate a basic network around the country. But a basic network means that we reactivate a quantity of, of, of stations that we can maintain. In parallel, we integrate, we will integrate, and we already signed some, uh, some agreements with the local governments, with uh, private and public enterprises to integrate local networks to have more eyes in, in other places. That is a, that's a mechanism of, uh, a, it, that's a cost-effective mechanism to gain, to gain a monitoring that not cost to the INAMI. Uh, another interesting mechanism uh, related with monitoring is so it, it's, a, it's a global mechanism called the uh, SOF of WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. SOF is the Systematic Observation Financial Facility. Uh, SOF can finance uh, the reactivation of the GBON network. GBON network is the global basic observation network. It's the basic network that will fit the global, uh, global models. So if, if, if Ecuador of, if, uh, of uh, every country starts to report to the GBON network, we will receive uh, better, uh, better model outputs. So that's really, really, um, really important. So in, in Ecuador, we really work in local ideas, uh, in local ideas also with a sustainability models for maintaining the local network, but all of this connected with uh, global projects. So uh, there are projects, there are money, there are uh, a lot of ideas. At Inami, we will work with these ideas always integrated. In integrate network, integrate global ideas, in integrate local and cooperation budgets to maintain a local, a local network that will report to global um, uh, global databases in order to maintain also, as, a, a, as I mentioned in, in my first intervention, to, to maintain global services like early warnings for all, uh, like uh, global platforms, hydrological, hydrologic, 
call service, uh, etc. So we are ready to work. We have uh, fresh ideas, and we we keep in work to reactivate and uh, mostly maintain and uh, assure the functionment of uh, of the local network and uh, reporting to the to the global databases. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, very strongly agree with uh, the first two uh, two questions. Yes, we need more monitoring. In water, it's often said, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And um, I fully agree with that. We we, we lack uh, data fundamentally in so many parts of the of the world. Uh, and the second uh, question about uh, how we generate that data. Uh, indeed, I see great opportunity for. Uh, new types of data collection from citizen science to participatory monitoring to what is often sometimes called non-constitutional um, monitoring or, or um, uh, different different types of, of monitoring. And I can't don't have the time to go into too much detail, but if I'm allowed to make a bit of publicity for my talk tomorrow, then tomorrow morning I certainly will touch upon that topic and give some examples from this region of uh, novel types of, uh, of monitoring and data collection. Perfect. Okay, so I wanted to point out, based on the questions also, that we have a project in which we are trying to uh, get to know all of these things. The project is called SWATCH, and through SWATCH we are trying to have climate, project, climate projections here in the city of Cuenca. So we are also trying to give so, and provide some climate change indicators that can be used by decision makers and that can be used by the consultant. And also, um, based on those climate projections, we are going to uh, provide some adaptation and strategies, but we are trying to construct, construct and build and discover these adaptation strategies with decision makers, with ETAPA. And we are also trying to reduce water consumption in the city, taking into account the communities. So working with the communities and, and uh, understanding their water use habits in order to reduce this water consumption. So I think we are trying to look in at different uh, or all the various actors that we have in this uh, water towards water security. Thank you very Thanks. much. So Viviana, the last word to you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, yeah, when we are uh, doing our projects, uh, consulting projects, we always have this lack of data to calibrate our models uh, to validate the results that we are obtaining from the models that we do uh, for our designs. And that is something that we are missing here. And it will be very important if we will have more monitoring and also, as you say, if we can have these uh, climate alerts uh, that we can also use for as a model input that will help a lot in consulting. And also um, uh, the, the community involvement, I think that is very important because um, as I said, the projects that we do, they happen very fast. We have very limited time and of course we do socializations and we try to involve the community, but th that is something that has to be done not only by us, but also by the companies that are the owners of the project. They have to build that relation with the communities in order for a project to work and to and to have people, I, I mean, proud of having a project and they have to be aware of the why they are going to have uh, the project, what benefits the project will bring to them and how they can uh, also support to the project. So that is something that we are uh, missing and is very important here. Well, th Viviana, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you and thanks to the organizers to allow us these extra minutes. Uh, uh, we hope that uh, with the great support of the panelists, we could uh, shed some light of some, some of the things we will for sure reflect upon further during this conference. So from my point of view, I think I would agree to the first question that sometimes we still need to work to understand each other better, but I think this was a big uh, contribution to that. Sometimes we may use the same words uh, or, or different words for the same thing. Sometimes we use the same words, but still don't understand each other. So uh, dialogue and uh, also looking into the 
realities of other sectors, of other communities is very important. Thank you for giving great examples. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your questions. And thanks for the host in particular.